I want to thank you for joining us on this Tuesday in Epiphany. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for joining us together today. And <clears throat> one in spirit, we may not be physically present, but we pray that you continue to unite us as one. And we just ask you to open up and reveal to us your epiphany for us this day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we are in the season of Epiphany, and again, it's after Epiphany, I should say. The very first Epiphany was the revelation of the nature, the character of Jesus Christ as told to us through the gifts of the three wise men. What the, Well, the three gifts of the wise men. We don't know, as we mentioned the other week, how many wise men there actually were. We just know that there were three gifts, the golden frankincense and myrrh. They told us about the nature, the character of Jesus. During the season of Epiphany and after Epiphany, we are supposed to look for the epiphany, the aha moment, the revelation that God is trying to show us about the nature, the character of Jesus, something new that we didn't know before that, that is meant to touch and transform the way we think and the way we look at this world and the way we treat one another. Today's lesson is really interesting because we've been looking at the uh, epistle lessons during the Tuesday services. We're going to get back to that. And so today we're looking at 1 Corinthians 12. And it's weird because they have oftentimes nothing to do with the gospel lessons. Over the last few years, we've been looking at the Old Testament lessons. And remember, we use what's called a lectionary on Sunday mornings. The lectionary gives us a series of readings over a three-year period of time from the Old Testament, uh, a psalm, the epistle lesson, and the gospel lesson. And typically, the gospel lesson, the Old Testament lesson, and the psalm all seem to develop a very similar theme. But the epistle lessons, because again, there's just not as many of the epistle lessons as there are those other lessons, sometimes they just don't seem to fit well. Well, we just did something Sunday on the wedding of Canaan and Galilee, and this, just, this lesson just doesn't seem to have any connection to it whatsoever, except for a very, very slim connection with this word gift. And the wedding at the Canaan and Galilee, of course, Jesus gave a gift gift of the best wine of the day under what seems like a relatively mundane circumstance. Why would the God of universe care about this wedding at the Cane of Galilee? But this again just demonstrates to us the caring and the love that God has for our ordinary, the circumstances of life, just the, the ordinary celebrations of life. God is truly present with us. And this is a spectacular thing. But we're going to look at the word giftedness and how that applies to today's lesson, and maybe that'll be our theme that connects this lesson with the gospel lesson. But 1 Corinthians 12 is a really famous passage about spiritual gifts. The first thing I want you to understand is that we are dealing with a church in Corinth that is in great, oh, let's get red here. That's better yet. Conflict. These people really do not like each other, and they're fighting each other. Uh, the, the rich are, are opposing themselves to the poor, quite frankly. Sounds like the common theme that we have going on year after year, decade after decade, millennia after millennia in this world. The rich always think that they can have one over on the poor, and they often get what they want. That's one of the reasons why rich people are rich and poor people are poor. So uh, this again is going on in the church at the church in Corinth, and they have no consideration for each other. Paul, really this famous passage of chapter 12, drops a big bomb on top of this whole thing and says, look, you folks won't get anything done if you don't do it together. You've all been gifted, but your gifts don't make any sense if you don't pull them together and use them together. You've got a part of the puzzle, the picture, that God wants to create. So with that in mind, let's read our lesson for today. So again, Paul starts, conflict in the church. Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And so remember, we've just celebrated the season of Christmas, and we all think of Christmas as the Christmas tree and the presents under the tree and family coming over and so forth. And we're always excited about what our loved ones will get us for Christmas and what's going to be under the tree. Um, oh, this is so much better than that. You know, you get a pair. I remember 
um, always waking up on Christmas morning, and you'd always know you'd have this big package like this, and you're like, oh, it looks so exciting, and you grab it and squeeze it and realize it's soft, and like, oh, it's going to be underwear or socks, right? Always a disappointment, and you're always looking for the good presents. You know you're going to get some of the clothes that you don't get any other time of year. It just happens. But in this case, God wants to give to us a gift that is better than any gift you've ever received underneath the Christmas tree. In this case, it's a spiritual gift. But as I said, remember, your spiritual gift doesn't make any sense outside of the context of other Christians. So this is what Paul's saying. So, you know that when you're pagans, you are enticed and led astray by idols that could not speak. This is kind of a continuous theme. You know, pagans, again, those who are, are um, typically earth worshipers or, or whatever, those who are um, drawn to um, natural uh, revelations of God and think that it's God. I mean, we can look at the sun and think how spectacular that is, and it is spectacular, how wonderful the earth is. Those are evidence of God, but they themselves are not God, okay? The pagans will worship these things as God. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit ever says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a, there is a in the atheist's uh, Field, uh, atheists will have a thing called the Blasphemy Project, where um, they scream and say in the most disgusting, vile ways that Jesus is Lord, just to make a mockery of this and say, see, God didn't strike a step. I think, again, um, we all misunderstand this. You can be an atheist and say Jesus is Lord and kind of snicker behind the back just to make a mockery of it. You know, it, it's not like you're going to be struck dead all of a sudden because, first of all, that's not the nature and the way of God. God loves atheists, even those, who, even those who are really vile and just want to prove in their mind that there's no God. God's not going to strike them dead. That's not the nature and the character of God. God is a, a God of love. So what is Paul trying to say? How can a person ever say, let Jesus be cursed? Or no one speaking by the Spirit can ever say, let Jesus be cursed. Um, he's basically saying, you're not going to deny Jesus, if you have been touched and transformed by the love of God, you are not going to deny him. Now, I think this is actually from some very real-world circumstances where in Corinth, to get a job, sometimes you had to prove that you are not a Christian. There was discrimination against that or of a particular brand. Paul saying, look, if you've really been touched and transformed by God, you're not going to deny that. God is going to provide for you. Don't deny your relationship with God. If you're truly motivated by the Spirit, you're not going to say that. No one can also say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. Now again, yes, atheists can say Jesus is Lord in a snickering sort of way, but he's talking about that passion, that commitment to Jesus being your Lord. In other words, the Spirit of God is going to touch and transform your life if this is the type of relationship, if you are submitting your need to Jesus, the Spirit is going to truly transform your life. And now we go to verse 4. So, there are varieties of gifts. Here we go. We finally get to the gifts. But it is the same Spirit. You're going to hear this word Spirit throughout. The Spirit is that revelation of God that overcomes division that brings us together, that inspires us with gifts, that muse on our shoulder, that shows us the way to go. And so this is who the Spirit of God is. So the Spirit comes to us, the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but it is the same Lord. There are varieties of activities. So you're going to notice two words here. So you have Spirit, you also have varieties. Nobody is an island unto themselves. There's a whole cornucopia of spiritual gifts that God has blessed us with. There's no one particular gift that somebody ought to have. 
So churches, for instance, we're going to hear about tongues in a minute. There are some churches that say, everybody's got to speak in tongues. Otherwise, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just boulder dash. That is totally contrary to what Paul is trying to write to us. Everybody's got a variety of gifts or mixture of gifts. You are unique. You have a unique mixture of gifts that God intends for you to use within your context in conjunction with other Christians. That's important. That's what Paul's trying to convince us of. Because remember, this conflict in the church, he said, get over your conflict. You're created to go together. So he goes on, variety of activities, the same God who activates all of them and everyone. Each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. I cannot emphasize that enough, okay? This is the whole purpose of this passage, to overcome this conflict, these people who think that they don't need other people. You know, I was told one time by a mother of three kids, it was years ago, she said, you know, I don't really need to bring my children to church for them to have a relationship with God. Well, there's probably some truth to that. You can try the best you can at home to teach people about their relationship with God. But the one thing they don't grow up understanding is the purpose and the importance of the church. And they grow up away from the influence of other people, the love of other people. And sure enough, about 10 years later, this mother came to me in tears and said, I don't understand why all of my children have rejected that relationship with God. Well, they weren't connected with the church. See, faith is not an individual sport. It's a team sport that is meant to be played together. Can you imagine going out and playing football and just saying, I'm the quarterback, I'm the center, I'm the quarterback, I'll hike the ball to myself, I'll pass the ball or hand it off to myself, I'll block for myself. You can't do that. It requires other people. It wouldn't be very fun, would it? If you're the only person on the field. I'll tackle myself, I'll be the other team. It's dumb. That's the same thing like a Christian who tries to live their life without the other Christians. You can't. So he goes on. To one is given the spirit of utterance of wisdom, <sighs> the other utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, another faith by the same spirit. We have faith for each other. I love that one. So there are times where I run out of faith, where I just have, I'm holding on by rope. This is why we need the church. And somebody has faith on my behalf. You are doing these things for other people. That's the whole point. Uh, to other, gifts of healing by one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all of these things are activated by one and the same spirit who allots each individually as the spirit chooses. But again, with the emphasis that these are meant to be used for the common good. Now, this is one of the things that, just kind of as a, a final aside here, we have people with the spiritual gift, or at least the claimed spiritual gift of healing. And they make a big ordeal of it, and a big stage show of it, and they get lots of money from that. All of these gifts are important. Nobody should be put on a pedestal because of the spiritual gift that they have. Nobody should be making lots of money off of spiritual gifts, okay? These gifts are meant for the common good, not for my materialistic blessing. So these are inappropriately used when they lie in my pockets and gild them with gold because they're meant to be used for the purpose of the common good to bless this world with the presence of Jesus Christ. You've been blessed, my friends with a wonderful gift of God, a variety of or a mixture of some of the spiritual gifts that were mentioned. There are probably even more. You were meant to use those gifts 
in conjunction with other Christians for the common good so that this world might be blessed. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, the most important gift of all. And we thank you that from this gift, each one of us are gifted with spiritual gifts that we use to bless the world in conjunction with other Christians. Continue to use us, bring us together with those people with whom our gifts fit and make sense so that we can truly touch and transform this world, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.